Thank you so much, Brian Hook, mm -hmm. for giving us the time today here once again. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. We want to talk about the sanctions. I mean, I know this policy has been caught everybody by surprise in the region and around the world of what happened to Qasem Soleimani, the number one terrorist or wanted terrorist in the world. Um, but now we want to know more about our the steps that followed, the sanctions, the mm -hmm. new sanctions. Can you tell us a little bit more about these sanctions? What do they mean for the Iranian regime? They tried to underplay it and say they were not as effective or not as important. Um, tell us a little bit more. Well, when President Trump came to office and we started reversing Obama's policy of accommodation with Iran and sanctions relief, we came in and reversed that. And so now here we are almost three years later and we have done 30 rounds of sanctions targeting over 1,000 individuals and entities. These unilateral sanctions have put Iran on uh, in, in a state of almost economic collapse. Now the regime is a kleptocracy and uh, they steal the Iranian money Money's people to make themselves rich and to make their proxies rich. So the combination of our pressure, sanctions, and the regime's uh, tendency to steal the wealth of their own people has created a financial crisis for the regime. There were all sorts of experts who were saying that when America went alone and without the backing of the UN, that our sanctions wouldn't be effective. Our sanctions have been so much more effective than anybody in, in among the experts ever dreamed of. And as a consequence, Iran, the regime, is facing its worst financial crisis in its history while they're facing their worst political unrest in its 40-year history. That's not an accident. That is the product of, a, of an American strategy led by the president that's been in place for almost three years. So the new sanctions are going to continue this pressure on the regime and they are effective. I mean, unlike, like you said, this has been their strategy of trying to underplay this yeah. strategy by the United States. Um, now we're talking about the Ukrainian airplane mm -hmm. and the downing of that airplane, which took 176 innocent lives. Right. Um, is the United States involved in the investigations about this, the details of what happened? Well, the, the downing of the jetliner was a tragedy. It is unfortunately the kind of thing that happens when the Iranian regime is always on a footing of constant warfare. And this regime has a 40-year history of being an outlaw regime uh, that is always expanding and expanding and expanding, and they use violence. They, they, they try to sort of using Qasem Soleimani and others uh, to destabilize the Middle East. And so, uh, with respect to the jet crash, Secretary Mnuchin announced that there will be exemptions from our sanctions regime for any American organizations that need to help with the investigation of the plane crash. We do know that, that the regime shot down the airplane with a missile. And so the regime has admitted it, uh, but this is the kind of thing that happens with the regime, and now the Iranian people are mourning the deaths of yet more innocent Iranians. What is the United States uh, prepared to do um, to basically, as a consequence for the Iranian regime and what they have done yet again? with more civilian casualties. Well, the president over the weekend tweeted four times in Farsi. And that's not the first time he's done that. But now that we see the people back on the streets protesting against the regime, and what they're chanting is, Soleimani was a murderer, and so is Khamenei. Mm -hmm. The other thing that they're chanting is, be afraid, be afraid. And that is a, that is a chant that they're, that they're pointing at the regime. Mm -hmm. They're saying that the regime should be afraid because the Iranian people are together and they're unified. And no matter how many people they jail or try to kill, the Iranian people keep coming out because the regime does not have any support of the Iranian people. The regime today clings to power on the basis of brute force. Mm -hmm. I mean, we did see the videos of Iranian students refusing to walk on the American and Israeli right. flags. But what is the United States prepared to do to help these protesters? A lot of people are asking about uh, support through internet, providing mm -hmm. internet, or doing other ways, other things to help these protesters. Yeah. Basically, more than 1,500 of them were already right. killed by the regime. I know. 7,000 detained uh, already. So what we've done, when I uh, assumed this role a year and a half ago, I started working with technology companies to get uh, into the hands of the Iranian people 
tools to circumvent the regime when it tries to stop Iranian people from talking with each other. And so we know that tens of thousands of people used those tools in November. And we're going to continue to try to do everything we can. The president told the regime, don't shut down the internet. Uh, he also told the regime, do not attack your own people. He said the world is watching. You didn't hear any of this during the Obama administration. You heard the opposite. In 2009, during the Green Revolution, you had Iranian people holding up signs saying, asking if President Obama was with the people or with the regime. And the Iranian people who sacrificed their lives for the cause of freedom should never have to ask where America stands. What about the ballistic missile program now that we see that the Iranian regime has attempted to attack an Amer uh, Iraqi military base that ha is housing and housing uh, right. American uh, military? The same thing happened also yesterday with the Balad. Um, yeah. uh, also, there was another attack, probably not ballistic missile, the one from yesterday, right. the Balad. But what is the United States prepared for to do about the ballistic missile program and obviously the proxies that are still running wild in countries like Iraq? It's really important, I think, that you focus on this because Iran, the regime, has the largest ballistic missile inventory of any country in the Middle East. And what I've been arguing for the last few years is that the Iran nuclear deal has come at the expense of curbing Iran's missile program, and quite the opposite. The Iran nuclear deal ended the prohibition on the regime's ballistic missile testing. And there's also a certain uh, unspoken agreement that the people that are in the deal are going to look the other way when Iran starts proliferating missiles. And I have been arguing for the last year and a half that we are accumulating risk of a regional war if nations of the world don't stand up to Iran's missile proliferation. And then we saw the attack when Iran attacked Saudi Arabia on September 14th with missiles. They attacked the United States with missiles a few days ago. And their proxies use Iranian missiles to attack uh, diplomats and, and, and soldiers around the Middle East. This is the problem set that nations of the world need to get serious about and join the United States in its campaign of maximum pressure and diplomatic isolation because it's working. My last question, because I know yep. we are out of time, um, the nuclear program, what is the type of the negotiations that we're talking about? What will we be different yeah. this time if we are proposing negotiations, as Secretary Esper said, uh, with no preconditions? Yeah. What would they, how would they differ from the Obama administration and their nuclear deal? It would, it, it's going to differ in a lot of really big ways. Number one, we're going to restore the UN Security Council standard that the Iranian regime cannot enrich uh, nuclear material. Over half of the countries in the world today that have peaceful nuclear programs don't enrich. The regime doesn't need to be enriching any fissile material. So that's number one. We're going to restore the standard. Two, we're going to submit any agreement that we, that we achieve to the United States Senate for a treaty. And then it becomes international law if it's ratified. The Iran nuclear deal that Obama did was a political commitment that was never submitted as a treaty. And when it was sent to New York to the UN Security Council, it's not even a binding resolution. So those are two very big things uh, that we're going to, it's no enrichment and we're going to get a treaty. And it's also going to go beyond the nuclear program. Mm -hmm. It's going to cover missiles and regional aggression and hostage taking. That's the kind of approach that we need to take. Thank you so much once again. You bet. Uh, Brian Hook for giving us the time today. It's great to talk to you. Thank you for having me on. Good questions. Thanks.